it's pretty clear to me that um, you know you can't have real justice, um, you know, if you like legal justice, in the field that I operate in. If you don't have social justice, I, I mean, I really feel it very, very strongly. You know, you you have to look beyond the courtroom door. Hello and welcome to Confessions. I'm Giles Fraser. This is the podcast where I'm joined by a well-known and hopefully interesting guest to find out what it is that makes them tick, where their underlying values come from. And today I'm joined by Helena Kennedy. What can I say? Um... Great campaigning lawyer, um, the master of Mansfield College, Oxford. I thought it was the principal, but you were the master of Mansfield College, Oxford. Doughty Street Chambers. I was really the principal, but somehow into that thing it went master. It says master at the end of your book. Can I tell you, they're all called... I thought you were principal. I'm principal. Oh. Uh, Because all the 19th century um, um, heads of houses, you know, the women's colleges, the new colleges were created in the 19th century, everybody was called a principal. And, uh, And so the wardens and the presidents and the and the proctor, those things all all date back to the very old um, places, um, and um, um, I used to always joke. You see, to people saying, "I, you know, they've made me the master, but I really want to be the mistress of, of Master <laughs> College." Right? And uh, and so um, and uh, I, and somehow or other, it found its way into the into the thing that I'm the master. In fact, I was the principal. That's what I thought. But I actually huh. wanted to be President Kennedy. Okay, pres- <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't come my way well anyway so like you're a person of a great many parts and um it's wonderful to have you here the 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 way in which we uh start helena is we um we normally uh i normally ask you a little bit to say about your background and where you come from and perhaps how your values and what's important to you grow out of that so you're from glasgow that's home for you yes. can you say a little bit about what home was like well i, I um i was brought up in a working class catholic family um my my parents were I mean, I suppose we were very Catholic. Um, you know, we went to mass every week, went to confession every week. You know, we we were very much part of the Catholic community in the south side of Glasgow. I was born in a small tenement flat. I mean, basically, it was what's called a two room and kitchen. You know, with very small rooms, and there were four children and wow. two adults. So, so it's it quite was, a lot to squeeze into that space. Yes, it was. It was. It was tight living. So I suppose I'm a child of the tenements. Um, we lived there until I was ten. And then we um, managed to get a council, a corporation house. And so we moved into council accommodation where I stayed until I came south to study law. My parents, I can honestly say my parents were really fine people. My Both my parents, rather different. My father, they were both, I would say, very good people um, in the way that they felt responsible, not just for their own family, but for the community and people around them. They always behaved decently. I was brought up with, with, with that being the way that we should be, that you didn't ever judge people by, you know, you know how well off they were, or any of those kind of things. I mean, my my mother used to always sort of say, "Never ever think you're better than other people, but never think anybody's any better than you." No, right, and right. so it was part of that thing is that we were my my mother would bow to nobody, and um and that included whether it was teachers at school or anybody. You know, my mother was respectful always, um but it was never you would never just um doff your cap to anybody. That sounds like you, Helena. Sounds a bit like me. And <laughs> I get that I think from my mother. Um, my father was a, a quieter character, um and he was. You know, although he was a working class man, you know, he, he took me to the library from my, when I was, you know, four or five, with him every week, and we got books out and. And I think had life presented him with other opportunities, he would have, you know, done different things. What did but he do? He worked in the newspapers. He was a, a dispatch hand would be the the way that if he was trying to make it sound posh. <laughs> um, but he was the, what they used to call it in the, the, his union was that he was a bundle strangler. I mean, basically, the newspapers would come off the presses and they would all pile up and he would um, they would be tied up in bundles and then they'd be thrown into vans and circulated around Scotland. And he worked on the daily record. Record while I was growing up, but I do remember in my in my very small you know, young childhood, four, five, six. I remember he had a period of unemployment, and I remember that business of being a casual labourer, where he you know he had to stand in a queue, and they would count down the queue one, two, three, four. Sorry, mate, you know we've got our cohort for tonight for the night shift to work. 
And, you know, I would feel holding his hand, I would feel the, the disappointment and having to go home and know that you, you didn't, you, you hadn't, you know, got the, any work for the next day and having to sort of live in that precarious way. Those experiences stay with you, I suppose. And But I also remember my mother helping other people. People would come to her where, you know, their husband might be alcoholic and um, would drink the wages on a Friday night. And my mother, and they'd come and she'd have not, they'd have nothing to feed kids with. And my mother going into cupboards and putting in tins of this and that and putting together some food to share with people who had, were left with nothing. And I tell the story because of, of my work on women and, and domestic violence and stuff was I was n not brought up in a household in which there was any of that at all. My my parents loved each other and um, were tender towards us. But um, I do remember that across the close that we lived in, the tenement that we building that we lived in, um, there was a family and there were some boys. I think their mother was dead, but they were young men. And one of them um, had married and has a young wife from England who had a baby and my mother was became very concerned about her and I could hear her talking to my father and she saw her with black eyes and things <gasps> um, and, and we could hear in the building you would hear if there was anything r r ruckus going on and I remember the, the girl coming to the door and my mother bringing her in and I was always the kid in the corner sitting in a corner with a book and I remember my mother going into a drawer and my mother used to hide bits of money in case of a rainy day, in case of a disaster, which is, of course, how working class people have to work. They, you know, something, somebody's going to die and we're going to need to go to a funeral or something. And so my mother used to sort of put, you know, the odd sort of pound note underneath the, the, the paper that she lined the drawer with. And I remember her getting out some money and I remember her giving it to this girl and saying to her, you know, go and go back to your mum and dad, go back home to England and giving, giving her her fear to take the baby and leave because she was being so abused. And I must have been about maybe seven or eight and I remember sort of listening. I was, I was always a watcher and listener and I remember her doing that and, you know, clearing herself out of any extra money in order to make it possible. That was the kind of woman my mother was. And they lived their faith. They, were, they, they really did live their faith. They were people who felt that their, their responsibilities were to others. And, um, and embedded within the community of faith as well. Within and... a community of faith, absolutely. And you were, <coughs> and I used to, you know, we, I mean, it wasn't just that you went to Mass on a Sunday. I mean, we went to benediction and we used to go to, you know, devotions and things to, okay. during the week. And, um, uh, you know, and you, you would scrape together the, the, your contribution to the church and all of that. And, um, you know, it was, it was very much part of our lives. And we went to Catholic school and that was how, how, how life was. And then you left home to go to university, I imagine. Well, I came down and I studied in London and, and became a lawyer, which was kind of, let me tell you, was not in my mother's uh, um, frame of reference and not something she greatly how, approved how did you, of. How, how, was, how did the law come into her? Well, I, well li uh, uh, listen, I came down and got a summer job as a, what was called a Girl Friday. You wouldn't be able to advertise for such a job nowadays, which was a kind of like being a runner, a run around, um, you know, uh, Going to the post office and doing in, in a law in firm. A, in, no, in an office in oh, in, uh, in the city. Um, but it was a it was an employment agency which had just at that time started up. This would be in the six, six you know late sixties, and um, and I uh, and I got to know all the women, the girls who worked in there. They were all sort of in their late teens and twenties. They were all wonderful, you know, you know, often working class women, but you know who were kind of aspiring, and they were all secretaries and that kind of thing, and um, and people in the summer would be students would come and work and they'd get jobs as clerks and the kind of jobs that don't exist nowadays, filing clerks and things. And that would be sort of to get some money together in order to have a holiday or whatever. And and um, I got to know some students who were at LSE. And you've got to remember, Giles, you're too young to know this. But oh. This was 1967, 68. There was a great deal of, you know, social unrest and students were very much at the heart of demanding a better society. And we were very much against the Vietnam War. And I was already uh, rather political. And Did your we, parents have a politics? I didn't my ask parents, you that. Oh, my parents were, were, were very much Labour Party okay, people. Yeah. My father had been in the war. My father was in the war for, you know, um, the, full, the full time from 1939 until, in fact, he came back a year later. He didn't get um, demobbed until 46. And they had a baby in 48 who, who died, a boy. So we were a family of four girls, but I was the replacement of the boy. And I think that I was the first baby 
that my father was really around for. And so I was a beloved child. And I think that 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 fed into um, the way that I experienced my early childhood. It was interesting. I mean, you know, this was it, this was a time when, you know, my mother worked her socks off. You know, my mother went to the wash house every week, you know, with a big a pram a load laden, yeah, yeah, laden with um, her washing piled up high and tied on with a rope. And she would um, uh, and my father always on a Monday when my mother did was her wash day and she went to the steamy, as we called it. Um, when she came home, my father always made the dinner on a Monday because my, my, my mother was, you know, she was whacked, you know, because she'd been, you know... But still quite traditional gender roles. Oh, to, a... oh totally, totally, no, no. Uh, absolutely. No. And um, and my, uh, um, I, you know, the, 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 we, didn't, we never ever had a car or, or, or we never even had a fridge or a telephone or anything. So g- take me into how you got into the law. So you're down in London, you're hanging out well, with these sort of well, like people with this, no, the spirit it. of 68. Yeah, well, the other thing was we had, my mother's had a... It was her cousin, but he was like a brother to my mother. Um, they were, she'd been brought up in trades in a very poor part of, of Glasgow. And um, her this boy, this young man, um, lived in the... was her, her um, aunt's boy. Um, and he became a priest. And we were very influenced by Father John, who would often, who went off, he got an education, he became a priest, he was a Silesian, and he, he ended up being headmaster of a boys' school, a sort of boys' posh Catholic school, and then ended up being a chaplain of a university in Africa, in Uganda, and then eventually the chaplain at Reading University. He was the, re- the only person in our family, you know, who had ever had an education. And he was very influential on us as children. And so when he would come back, um, he wasn't around so much for, I suppose, for Moira and Pat, my older sisters. But for me, he was um, there and encouraging and saying, you've got to you've got to go into higher education. And he encouraged me. And there was a time, you know, in fact, he um, scraped together some of his savings. I mean, and he didn't have much um, as a as a. A priest in an order, but he gave me. I always remember that when I had no money at all, when I was wanting to do pupillage, he gave me two hundred pounds. Wow! And so that sort of thing. Um, but <clears throat> he was a, a he was a very influential figure in our family life. I went in yesterday and got a couple of your books to refresh myself about. Yeah. And what's really interesting is that the last two books, the the the, the, the Eve was framed and Eve was shamed. Uh-huh. One of them is filed under. Uh, jurisprudence, yeah. and the other, it is in foils. Yeah. One of them is filed under jurisprudence, and one of them is filed under women's studies. Uh-huh. It's very interesting. And uh-huh. so, um, so you've got these sort of two parts of you, which is the sort of justice part and the campaigning part, oh. as it were. And they've they've always been uh, travelled together. They've always travelled together. That... Well, but for me, you see, Jazz, it's, it's pretty clear to me that um, you know you can't have real justice if you like legal justice in the field that I operate in. If you don't have social justice, I really feel it very, very strongly. You know, you 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 have to look beyond the courtroom door and understand the world outside in order to do a good job inside. Not if you're doing some sort of contractual fine print examination of you know the meaning of certain words in a contractual. Document document. Yes, yes, know. yes, yes. I don't do that. That's not my law. Yeah. I do the law that is about the human condition, the hum- the stuff of human life, uh, people falling from grace, people, people, you know, making horrible mistakes, people doing sometimes wretched things to each other. But for me, to understand that and to do the right thing in those circumstances, you, you have a, a, an obligation to understand the world the, in, the, the world beyond and the, the context in which things happen. So when people say, I don't agree with this, but when people say, you know, we've got too many campaigning lawyers, you get this this criticism sometimes yeah. that's made about campaigning lawyers as if there's something, yes. you know, there's something wrong with that, that you should be more, as it were, objective about the law. That's well, one of the criticisms. It's, it's part of a fiction that's created. You see, the fiction is that law is neutral, that law is wholly rational, that law, sh- law should not be imbued with anything to do with emotion. And and it's, it's a divide that we know in other areas too um, that business that the rational is male that the emotional is female and so on um, 
the the, real, the the business of the law being neutral was one of those things that we were all taught when we were studying law, and I bought into it as well. And so when I saw the law failing women as a young person, I became a feminist in this in the seventies. Um, I had a fairly strong class analysis already by that time. You know, I I knew how law failed working class people, but they didn't feel it belonged to them. It had not been made with them in mind. It was to it was to control them usually, and and very often failed to deliver justice for them. I remember my mother having her head split open by a slate coming off a kind of derelict tenement building. She was running to get the shopping and, you know, suddenly um, this slate comes down and, and, and it was an ill-maintained, rotten, horrible building that people were still living in. And um, and my mother nearly lost her sight over this thing. And people said to her, May, you should go to a solicitor and sue because those people that own that building, those landlords, and there were probably there were landowners in the north of Scotland who basically owned tenements all over Glasgow. You know, you should be getting compensation for that. My mother was very leery about the idea of going into a solicitor's office and they would start asking me for money even before we we got off the ground. This was a world that was was beyond our ken. And so you stayed away from it. And in fact, increasingly now, we're going back to that thing because legal aid has been so eroded that people are basically saying, law isn't for us. We have to just, you know. Now, my mother's answer to this was, it was God's will, you know, that you, okay. something happens to this you. This is a well. fatalism about yes, it. Yes, a sort of fatalism about it. And, you know, thank God, God was good to me. I've not lost my sight. Yes, yes. Um, and, and um, you know, I should just bless, count my blessings. I mean, I'm, I'm as fit as I am and, you know, and go on with things. That was, you know, the way that she dealt with life's, um, you know, you know, wrongs that Absolutely. happened, yeah, yeah. and so and she and so she just you know that was what people did, and uh, and so um, you know, law was not in our uh, in our um, you know experience, except that there were sort of odd whispers about, and it was usually men. There would be odd whispers about um, um, uh, a cousin of my father's um, uh, who. <laughs> who we all would laugh about because he'd gone to Berlini prison for wiring up his electricity to the street lighting. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and, uh, and, uh, and his ingenuity got him the punishment. Um, and there was another thing where something was said about my mother's brother when he was young. He was the, the baby of her family. There were seven in her family. And he was the young youngest. And he was um, he ended up going to Borstal because he'd got into trouble. Um, and he he was a sort of you know, adolescent teenager during the war, so he wasn't he wasn't enrolled, and um, got into trouble, and ended up going to Borstal, and the, and my grandparents wouldn't have him back in the house because of it, and then my mother took him in, uh, and again it's another example. My mm. mother was the one in the you know. Who did those well, where's the where's the so much to talk about? Was there a particular case? Helena, that made you self-consciously a feminist that you were that you were a part of. Was there something that sort uh, of listen, like? Well, the first the first case that I ever did, Giles. The first case I ever did was a woman who was being done for shoplifting, and she'd be done for shoplifting before, and um, she was a single parent with some kids, and um, and they said, oh, you know, you do a plea mitigation, and you talk about her circumstances, and you know, and so forth, and and the court will probably not do very much to her. So I go off. And I get to the court and I have my first lessons in life, which is that people often, as, as we know, are not frank about the full story of things that they're ashamed of. She told me, you know, about her circumstances, which were miserable. She was on her own. She was having to manage with these kids. Um, had obviously difficulty about managing money and, uh, and she would shoplift. And uh, it turned out that she had a suspended sentence. And she ended up going off to prison that oh, day. Oh God! And so the first case that I ever did was of of somebody, and she and I what remember. What happened to her kids? And I remember her saying, "Can you phone my neighbour? Can you phone you know?" And and named somebody wanting me to phone to say, "Can she take the kids? Because they'll take the kids into care." And let me tell you, this continues to this day. Yes. Which is that women. You know, who've done very little, um, 83%, as you, as you see in, in my recent book, 83% um, of women in prison are there for non-violent offences. And as a result, their children are taken into care, they're, they lose their council houses or their rental accommodation, they have difficulty then, of course, ever getting jobs or anything, and they are usually women who have experienced, you know, seriously, life's wretchedness. I, I mean, I was saying the other day... Uh, you know, I had someone bang on the door. Uh, universal credit, you know, ha hasn't been 
mm. kicking in, mm. kids to feed, and she was banging on the door, and she goes, I'm about to rob Tesco's. I was just about to rob Tesco's. I felt ashamed of doing it, and I've just come over here, and can you help me? And just the idea, if she'd have robbed Tesco's, I, yeah. I, I could not have condemned her. I mean, I'm just, I, I've, I, could, I could not have condemned her. You know, we think of miscarriages of justice and, and awful things at the high end, the high level. And I've certainly done those, you know, from the, you know, miscarriages of justice out, arising out of the Irish Troubles. I did lots of that terrorism stuff. And I've also done cases where, you know, um, people have been convicted wrongly of murder and, and the like and terrible things and spend long times in jail before they're released. But, but by God, there's plenty of it goes on at the very bottom end of the scale where you know people yes to commit what is ostensibly wrong but where you look at the circumstances and you think who is the offender and who's being offended against in 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 our world and um and that's where you learn your lessons Um, and um you know you get an i mean reading your books you get this overwhelming sense about the way in which what looks to be rational and neutral is actually loaded against yeah. certain sorts of people, against women, against minority groups. And... Of course. And so, I mean, I, I'm here talking about women, but it's a paradigm for what happens to anybody who's not been, who's not got a kind of, if you like, a, a purchase on the system, you know, where they can't um, go and get themselves uh, an expensive QC or whatever um, to deal with the, the, the things that happen to them. And uh, that's what I'm, I'm trying to describe here that um, if you want to deliver justice, there's a duty on us as lawyers and as uh, judges and as policymakers, people in parliament, really to understand the context from which people are, are coming. Most of, of, of the women who end up before the system as pe- you know, people in the dock um, have in the, themselves been abused. They have mental health problems, dependency problems. They've ended up in prostitution because of what life has served up to them. You know, very little agency in all of this stuff, you know, that I, you know, I, very few women are saying I choose to be um, a high-end prostitute. And there are some, of course, and there are some unscrupulous, um, there are some unscrupulous solicitors and way in which mm. people can be. I mean, I one of the things that I I find most of the legal issues that I deal with with the church are to do with immigration issues. Yes, of course. And you know, there's often uh, solicitors who are. I think they're preying on people. I mean, in insofar as they're, oh, you know, give us another 500 quid and we'll write. And they oh. write rubbish letters that are photocopied and they promise them the earth and, yes. and all this sort of stuff. And, Absolutely. you know, you just actually feel, oh, my God. I mean, I, I did grow up, I think, with a sense of, you know, a sense of pride in British justice and fair play and all those sorts of things. And actually, you know, these days when you look at it, it the system doesn't seem to work like that. Well, one of the things about that we've done, I mean, we've stripped legal aid to the absolute bone. And so w- what you end up doing is that, that that introduces into it the unscrupulous, people who, you know, are not going to operate with high ethical standards, but also <coughs> people who will do the other thing, which is, that, you know, if you're not going to, if, if, if you're going to do this kind of work and which you're representing poor people, you're, you open a door to corruption. Um, you know, if you don't have respect for the professionalism that, that's involved and therefore people feel would feel a sense of shame about falling down on it um, the, the whole way in which we've started sort of deregulating this, the, 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 the professions we're deprofessionalising the professions that's the reality and it's happening across the board and it started with the way that we heard people talking about teachers and talking about social workers and, and now it's about you know lawyers who do the work that's for, for ordinary folk you know um, it's partly because We've attached so much value to money. Um, I mean, that's one of the great uh, corrupting features in all of this stuff of recent years. As well, well, I'm I, I completely agree. You know, between your two Eve books, has, has there been a progress for women? There's, there's Me Too and there's course, things oh, have listen, been opened up. And listen, I mean, we're in a different world yeah, now, aren't we? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, the story of this is that I wrote Eve Was Framed in 1992. I'd become a QC the year before. By no means was all my work to do with women. I did lots of other things. But I'd been monitoring and watching carefully. And when I did, I did lots of cases which were about, you know, women who'd been abused and battered and all kinds of things who ended up themselves in the dock, sometimes for murdering abusive partners. And so I wanted to, I wanted to see change. 
change and we'd had a certain amount of reform but but none of it seemed to work and so I wrote the book it was quite controversial at the time 1992 but but because I was a QC and I, if I'd if I'd written it you know 10 years earlier it would have been dismissed 1992 I'm a Queen's Council um you know there weren't that many of us around you know I was in the history of, of becoming women becoming QCs I was number 40 so you know though right, we hadn't had right, that many right. and we got the debate really going um, lots have happened. I mean, first of all, the opening up of um, higher education has meant that many more women have now come into the law and we've got fabulous women. My chambers is full of the most wonderful women barristers. But um, we have, aren't seeing them, you know, moving right up through the with the same ease and the same oiling that happens for, um, uh, for men in the profession to the higher echelons of the judiciary. Yes, we've managed at last to get some, you know, three women we now have in the Supreme Court, but I mean, two went in in the last year because of, of the Baroness noise, Hale because and, we've yeah. noised about the, not made so much noise about it. Baroness Hill, um, a wonderful judge, yeah. you know, was there for 12, 13 years on her own in the Supreme Court because, you know, the, there was this thing, you know, we've got one. So, that, you know, <laughs> um, so I, I do think there's still problems on all of that front, but we've made lots of headway. These issues are on the agenda, but let, let's just look at it. Two women a week are killed by abusive part, you know, part by their partners. Every minute there's a phone call about domestic violence, and I'm afraid it's mainly women who are being being abused and battered. We've had the scandals of Savile and the scandals of Rotherham and the scandals of Rolf Harris and the and the, and the Catholic Church and the Anglican Church and the and you know and children's homes and, and think about their levels of abuse and so on. Have we have we really sorted it in that period of time? Twenty six years since I wrote that, and I'm afraid social media has added to the problems, um, has made it even more egregious and difficult to get convictions. Seven percent of rape complaints end up with a conviction. So it's pretty, pretty low. And so you, you have to ask what's going on. And a part, of, a part of it is that attitudes haven't kept up with you know, the, the, the expectations and aspirations of women. And is there some sense in which even though there's been all sorts of progress, there's, been, there's, there's also been all sorts of other problems that I mean you know you talk about pornography in yeah. your in your yes. um, book and the way in which the pornography on the internet the ubiquity of pornography mm -hmm. has shaped a generation's way of thinking about sex and about women and about yeah. objectification and all of that sort of stuff well I mean young boys are not and in fact even girls seeing this stuff they don't know what good sex looks like. You know, they don't know what, what that what that means, how that means. And so the mutuality that we as adults know comes with good lovemaking. They, that, they, don't, they, don't, they don't know about that. They're watching this stuff in which, you know, um, it's, uh, it's, it's usually about women delivering for, for, for men. And, um, and, and so it creates huge levels of anxiety amongst girls. Um, and uh, and you know we know about the the heightened levels of. Uh, I think boys uh, too as well actually. I, I think was, it... I was about to say. Yeah. And boys as well. And um, you know we know that there's all this business about um, uh, high levels of depression amongst our young. Yes. And a lot of it is about, of course, pressures and not knowing how what the future holds and all that kind of thing. But a lot of it also is about what does it mean to be. Um, a male and uh, and I'm successful sure right. in, in your masculinity. What does it mean to be female? And um, and I think that we've we've been making a mess of all this stuff. Uh, the other the, the ghastly thing is that um, you know you don't do a case now where you know the use of our mobile phone is is you know it's a bit ubiquitous. You know we we and of course it does have a very huge benefit in the um, in the investigation of crime because you can locate people in a particular place at a particular time. Um, people don't know the extent to which, of course, it provides huge amounts of information about you. And immediately before a crime takes place, you can look and see who you're in contact with, who did you speak to immediately before and immediately afterwards. And so the, the, the way in which this creates a, a mesh in which you can, you can deal with crime is... On the one hand, yes, it makes is a is a positive thing, but there's the negative thing, which is that, of course, our young are putting themselves out there, and so you know there are photographs of themselves, you know, with uh, in their knickers and bra or without their bra or whatever, and their boyfriends ask them to the boys at school say, you know, I, I want a picture of you, but and I, you know, and I'll never show it to anybody, and uh, and then of course they fall out, and then it's um, distributed to everybody in their auntie, and so horrible things that cause real misery um, uh, and wretchedness to people, and the the revenge porn, 
um, the ways in which you know the young now um, often you know I mean and, and I you know and people in courts of an older generation don't understand it the way in which sex is spoken about so you know in such an upfront way and they take it as for real um, and uh, and they think it somehow almost defies your right as a as a young woman to say I didn't want to have sex with him at that time in that way um, and it's so hard now to get convictions in cases and it's so easy to debase it, attitudes to a woman because it, of what's on her, her on her system. Is the problem with convictions and all the rest of the thing that we're talking about here, is it a problem with what's on the statute book as it were, what the law is actually, or is it as you say, that the law is a human enterprise and it's about society's attitudes and it's about human yeah. beings. Is, 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 is it the problem with the actual laws we've got or is it the fact that the law is obviously a, a peopled by people? Yeah. Well, I started off thinking that actually a lot of this is about the black letter law itself. You know, we've, got to, we've yes. got to reform the provocation law we've got to, because law was made by men. And, there's, uh, and, and there was certainly truth in that. But what, I, what this new book is saying is actually... Um, we've almost moved beyond that because we've tried all the business about cha- sh- reshaping the law, changing it. You know, uh, the reasonable man somehow is you know being re- re- reconfigured as a, a reasonable person, and um, and so we've 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 struggled with all of that stuff, um, but actually it's about that thing that you've just said that, that law is in is a human endeavor, and therefore its feelings are our feelings, but aren't we entitled to expect more of law? And I think that law has failed to keep abreast of um, the changes that have happened in our society. And I think that we've um, attitudinally, you know, we've failed to actually, you know, respect the ways in which women are st- have changed in what their expectations are. Um, and also um, that they have to be entitled to say no in circumstances in which somehow they seem to be prevented from doing so. I mean... It's that thing where, um, you know, so often when you're, if you're talking about, let's look at sexual harassment, um, women in the workplace, um, and we're not talking about, um, you know, film celebrities or, you know, stars. We're talking about ordinary women working in factory floors, working in uh, warehouses, working in all, all manner of places. And uh, you want time off from your, from your supervisor and he'll say, well, come, come on downstairs and talk to me about it. And women are expected to deliver, expected to do all manner of things in order to actually get what they should be entitled to. My child's sick. I need to. I need to go to a school th- thing to see the, the uh, on a uh, on a morning, a weekday morning. I, I need these things. And instead of it being your entitlement, if you are so in, in need of maintaining the job, then I'm afraid you become vulnerable. And in the same way, young women who are barristers or want to become barristers are vulnerable to keeping the goodwill of people who have power to make the the difference in how they how their uh, life will progress in the in the area of work that they've chosen and it doesn't matter what that area of work is and when they do make complaints even if they're successful they're seen as a troublemaker and they're often isolated and life is made miserable for them so you know we ha- we've, we're not we're not in a great place how of course, and I, we need men to come in yes, on our yes. side to do this, to help us make it different. You know, this isn't a women's issue. And that's one of the things that I, I, I hope that the book makes clear, is that I make it very obvious that I don't think that women can purchase justice at the expense of justice for men. You know, that's not the way forward. You know, you hear the business now of, you know, let's not have jury trials when it comes to rape cases. You know, let's, let's change the burden of proof so that, you know, we can convict people on a, a less high standard of evidence. No, you don't do that in order to, to, to get justice for women. But what you have to do is you have to get people's mindset shifted away from judgments which are not about what, what the case is relating to. And so um, I'm very clear, clear about it. But we need men to come on board in making the change. And that means men have to call out other guys speaking in degrading ways, knowing when we know that their behaviour is unacceptable. And it means that we, we have to change the, the currency. 
Eve. Let's talk about Eve. I mean, the interesting thing about Eve is that she's not confined to Christianity. You know, she's, she can, she figures in... in uh, but she's in, nonetheless know, in your Catholic in background. Ca- oh, that course. must have been a... It was, it, my, my granny used to say, you know, there'd be no bad men if there were no bad women. You know, oh, my oh, word. Oh, she, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, okay. you know, there isn't a major religion that I can think of that doesn't in some way hold women in a, in a lesser standing. And, uh, and, and, of course, it's religion that then gives rise to law. It underpins all of our legal systems. That that business of the Eve was the great temptress. There's, there's something deep in the psyche um, that makes women feel a sense of shame that they must have brought this on themselves. Um, and the Marys too, as well, yes. and not just just Eve, of course. Oh, there's no. that. But we it, have, was, it was the idea the whole... that. Well, I mean, I mean, for for us, um, the Virgin Mary was always, you know, held out as being how we had to be. That we that it was about purity. It was about, um, um, you know, being beyond reproach, um, and uh, and so, you know, those things live on. Um, even when people are shedding skins about, um, what, you know, if you like, the old-fashioned elements of religion, there are ways in which those things are too deeply embedded. Talking about the Catholic Church now, do you see yourself as a member of the Catholic Church? Are you sort of like oh, critical I, I, of it? I, I, I was, I, do you know that I recently met Martin Scorsese? He came and got an honorary degree at Oxford. And uh, and I said to him, I've really wanted to, to talk to you because I once heard you out in an interview <laughs> saying when somebody said Catholicism is there present in all of your work. And he said, yeah, I suppose it is. And and they said to you, um, you know, uh, 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 are you a Catholic? And he said, and you thought about it for a minute, and you said, I'm not sure about the business about God, but I'm definitely a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and that's why you, that's and, why you and, are. And he, and he roared with laughter, and he said, do you know, I don't remember saying that. And he said, but it's true. And I said, well, I, I, I always claim then that I'm a sort of Martin Scorsese Catholic. Listen, I, I actually do believe, um, I, I, I actually do believe in the goodness of the human spirit. I, I actually do. And I actually think that you can speak to that better part um, of, of, of almost everybody, everybody that I've ever met. Um, occasionally I've, met, I've acted for people who are psychopaths and there's something that's somehow not there. But, um, but, but you know, I, 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 and I believe that that is the essence of what God is about. That aspect of, of humankind I still love lots of aspects of my Catholic upbringing that I feel are part and parcel of who I am. Um, and I do think it is The about. ritual. And I also love that. Yes, I love the ritual. I mean, I, I, I actually do believe that ritual matters. And, and it's always been a bit of... The, the left have always been rather dismissive of all of that stuff. And I, and I, don't, I don't buy that. I, I actually think that ritual is important. Rites of passage are important. You raise the level of the way in which people deal with each other by having levels of ritual. They're forms of belonging, which well, are, yes. that's part of... It's, and it's part of what shaped you in terms of, you know, yes. South Glasgow, those sort of forms of belonging which actually included other people they weren't they were they, no, they were the, they were the manner yes. of yeah that's right um and so i like that yes. and i regret a rejection of of some of that stuff because i think it's so important i think that people are now reaching out for it again um in in lots of areas of their lives and they and, and and it's like this business of people saying well why shouldn't there be humanist marriage it's because people want there to be some form of ritual, even if it's not um, the forms that once existed. Uh, it's very interesting. But um, yes, no, I am, I am most certainly, I think, still a Catholic. Your, um, your sort of sense of, of the goodness of human beings, um, I'm interested in this because one of the things that I get from you, that we've never talked about this, and <clears throat> one of the things I feel I share with you is I've always had a soft spot for the disgraced. <laughs> no, I do too. <laughs> and I I, too. I've always thought you would as well. Always. And you must see that in your work all the time. Totally. And there's a sort of, I don't even know how to put this, but I've known a number of people in my life who've been disgraced. And actually there is a sort of, there is something about, there's something that people learn or there's something that can be, uh, there's some sort of wisdom in the disgrace. I don't, that sounds wrong. That's the wrong way of putting it. That's completely the wrong way of putting it. I don't know how to put it, really. But there's something about the disgrace that I've learned from and I have a sort of soft spot for. I don't know how to put that. I haven't but put it, that no, any no, at all no, right. No, 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 you have. Because 
what you're describing is that the process of disgracing someone in which the, the larger community decides that somebody has fallen beyond the pale and, 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 and uh, um, has done something that um, um, is, is, you know, worthy of, you know, c condemnation. Um, for me, it, 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 there's a, the, the humbling, the humbling of someone um, because of something wrong that they've done um, is... Um, it often brings to the person who's been humbled, um, uh, I don't know, some the humanity is more raw and exposed. Yeah, that's what I mean. That's what uh, I want there's to some, say. There's something so exposed about their humanity. Yeah. And I immediately empathise with it. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I mean, I know it's mocked as being that you're, you're always on the side of the underdog. Yes, yes, yes. Um, um, but it's not because actually... Um, I, I feel that I'm, I end up being myself enriched by that and and it, and, and it also kind of slightly un, unclothes me too by I, I, I always do that thing of feeling it could happen to anybody yeah, it could yeah, happen yeah. you know yeah. never feel so uh, um, protected that it couldn't happen to you and yours and so I um, yeah it's very interesting it is interesting Elena, can I ask you about um, one other thing I want to ask you about is about one of the sort of hot topics of the day, I guess, is is about, I suppose the question is, what what is a woman? Uh, these yes. days, there's a sort of like there's a that doesn't seem to be a question that we used to ask. But now we're, we're asking even more people going to prison who have transitioned yes. and or people uh, who self declare. I mean, people I who think, self declare. I think the business of people who people who have changed um, their, their gender identity and actually gone through a process of you know medical process and and uh, and surgery. Then I think that you know that that that's the easy bit in in a way. I did the first case actually um, uh, of. Uh, uh, transgender case um in before the international um well you know before the european court of justice and it was about somebody who you know when he announced that he was going to transition to become a woman um was was uh, was told to you know you'd have to work around the back they wouldn't they weren't, they weren't going to let it, let um um her work at the front and so we took the case and we, and we ended up winning it and by vir the virtue of that we started opening up other doors and human rights issues and went to the european other courts too but um I, I I feel that there's a rather n nasty thing has happened, which is um, the, in the in the course of this debate, it is al it's almost as if one's a a attacking um, people who 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 are faced with gender dysphoria, and um, my ex the pain that people suffer with this, um, I've you know I've acted for a whole number of people who've been going through this process, and the way in which they're victimised, the way in which they are abused, and sex and raped and yes, sexually yes, yes. abused. Yes, I mean, yes, it's yes. just horrifying. Yes, yes, and yes. so to be cruel to people going through this is terrible. Yes. Now. We've, we've just had a case of, of somebody in the prison system who on self-declaration went in and then ended up, um, I think, raping or sexually uh, interfering with women in a women's prison. Well, that is a that is a criticism of our processes for assessing risk um, and so on. But, I mean, but think of the other circumstance where you put you put somebody who is um, transgendering, um, who is uh, from... Uh, uh, male to female, but who who has still got a male birth certificate, and you're going to put them into a male prison, and and you run the risk of their being raped in a male prison and possibly multiply raped. So it goes in either direction, you know. So we've got to be very very careful. When what this is about is about how do we protect those who are vulnerable in our society, those who are vulnerable to attack, who are seen as other and therefore can be abused. Now, um. You know, I think that the self-identification issue does pose problems. It does pose problems, you know, on a number of different things. Somebody today on um, on radio was talking about how difficult it is to do research on things like ovarian cancer. How do you do it when in this field of sport? If somebody says, says "I'm declaring that I'm a woman," and decides to want run in women's races, well, I think that you then bring in. You have to have assessments which are made, and and uh, and I think that there are uh, rules that you could set down. But I just think that we we must be compassionate in all of this. And I don't like that it's veered into a debate that has been uh, absent of enough compassion and understanding of what people go through. So um, I'm learning too. I'm learning too. Um, but I think that um, 
we have to see this as about human rights. And it means that we have to have very good risk assessments. And if necessary, we have to make special provision for people who are um, in this uh, in this transitioning or in this special category. Helena Kennedy, I just your humanity and your compassion is your watchwords and they come through. Oh. It's just like lovely. It's lovely to talk to you. Always with profit. Thank you. Well, very nice. Thank you. Thank nice you. Thank being you. Here Thank, with you. With you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Confessions with me, Giles Fraser. If you're enjoying the podcast, please do rate and review it and do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I'll be joined by another guest next week for another episode of Soul Bearing and I do hope you'll tune in then. And do check out the website, unheard.com. <laughs>